We get into some fun stuff. Uh, historically, this is a pretty dense topic. I'm not going to try to sugarcoat things. Uh, students will often sort of come to a stop here and say they can't do calculus. That's not true at all. Everyone makes it through. Uh, I would recommend that you not take notes on this video yet. Pause the video after I'm done with the solution and try to reproduce the solution yourself. So see if you can retrace the steps without looking at it and then just look at one line and then go back and try to continue it yourself. Watching someone else solve this problem is not going to help you in the long run. So, I mean, that, that's the case with any math problems, but uh, here, especially more than anything else, notation becomes an issue uh, for students who are not careful with limits and summations as well. So this is sort of notation hell for a lot of people. Uh, that being said, if you're careful with notation, it shouldn't be an issue. So here we're asked to find an upper and lower sum, so overestimate and an underestimate, uh, for the region bounded by the graph of y equals x squared, the x-axis between x equals 0 and 2. So I should draw a graph here. y equals x squared looks like so. Let's say this is 2 and this is 0. We're looking for this area. Notice that we're not given the number of subdivisions. So if we're not given the number of subdivisions, we assume it to be an infinite number. And now, actually for the first time, we'll see how we can actually deal with that. So first off, we need to find the width. The width will be the upper limit minus the lower limit over n, but we don't know what the number of subdivisions is, so we'll just leave that as n. I understand I just said infinity. You'll see why in a moment. So b is 2 minus 0 is a over n. Well, that's just 2 over n. So each of the rectangles that we place in here will have a width of uh, 2 over n. And then the next one after will be 2 over n as well. And then so on. The height, because we're using right endpoints, now I want you to pause the video here and think about why a right endpoint would be used to find the overestimate. Hopefully you've had a chance to think about this, but let's say for the sake of argument, I were using two subdivisions just to visualize this easier. If I were to get an overestimate, my first rectangle cannot be down here because that would yield an underestimate. The first rectangle has to be up here. And then the second rectangle has to be up here. That's the only way I can get an overestimate. In order to make either of those two things happen, this has to give me the height of the first rectangle. This has to give me the height of the second rectangle. And those are right endpoints. So I have to use right endpoints to get an overestimate or an upper sum. And vice versa, I'm going to have to use left endpoints to get an underestimate or uh, uh, a lower sum. So earlier we said that the height can be given by this function. The f of the lower limit, which in this case is going to be 0, plus, I'll write it off to the side, 0 plus b minus a over n. So that's delta n. That's the width we just found up above. 2 over n times i. Well, 0 plus 2 over n i is simply f of 2i over n. If, if my function is f of x equals x squared, and I need to find f of 2i over n, what I'm really doing is taking 2i over n and plugging it into my function. And if I do that, I'm going to get 2i over n squared, which is really 4i squared over n squared. And that's exactly what we have right here. Continuing on. Now, I want you to ignore these limits for now. Just ignore it. Would we agree that the area with n subdivisions would be the height the height is given by 4i squared over n squared times the width. The width of each of those subdivisions is 2 over n. So pause the video. Make sure you understand where these two expressions came from. 
This is the height of each of the rectangles based on what i is. And this is the width of each of the rectangles. And it does not depend on i because the width is the same no matter where you are. So it's not going to change based on the counter value changing. It's just dependent on the number of subdivisions, which is n. If n goes up, the width goes down. If n goes down, the width goes up. It does not depend on where you are on the function. However, the height of the function will change based on the counter. The height of the function here is different from the height of the function there, which is different from the height of the function there, and then so on. So the height of the function or the rectangle is going to depend on our counter in some way. The width of the function or the width of the rectangle doesn't care. On where you are, it's always the same. So here we can combine these two fractions by multiplying them. 4 times 2 will give us 8. i squared doesn't have a counterpart, so it stays. n squared times n yields n cubed. Now, 8 is a constant. It's a scalar multiple, so I can throw it outside the summation. And you'll notice that n is just the number. n is the upper limit. It's not a counter. n does not change. The number of subdivisions is set at the beginning of the problem. So it might be 100, it might be a million, it might be an infinite number. It might be 5. But n does not change. n is a constant. i is what is assuming different values. So i is the index, it's the counter, 1, 2, 3, so, so on and so forth. That's what's changing. So 8 is a constant with respect to i. n cubed is a constant with respect to i. So what we can do is take both of these out of the summation because of the scalar multiple property of summation, which was right here. Scalar multiplication property says that if I have a constant being multiplied by a term, I can pull the constant out, and it's not going to change the summation. Now, once we've taken out the constant 8 over n cubed, we're left with the summation of i squared from i equals 1 to n. Remember, this is where those formulas that I said you have to memorize come in to help us. We know that this formula is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. If we multiply this out in the numerator, you would get n times n plus 1, which is n squared plus n. And if you foil that out against 2n plus 1, you should get this. Pause the video, convince yourself that this algebra was done correctly. Now we can multiply the 8 by the numerator, multiply the 6 by the denominator, and then you get something very bad happened here. This should have an n cubed, my mistake. Please make sure you fill that in. So if I multiply 8 by 2n cubed plus 3n squared plus n, we get 16n cubed plus 24n squared plus 8n. And if I multiply 6 by n cubed, I get 6n cubed. So I had told you to ignore the, the limits for now. Coming back here, if we say that the area is approximately the same as this summation, which is the same as this summation, which is the same as yada, 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 all of this. Notice that there's no counter here anymore. There's no i. It's just n, the number of subdivisions we have. Hopefully you also remember that if we make the number of subdivisions increase without bound or go to infinity, we're going to get the exact we're going to approach the exact area under this curve. Only way we can make n push off to infinity is by taking a limit. So that's why this limit is here the entire time. If we take the limit as n approaches infinity, we're saying that the number of subintervals is going to infinity. Now, it's a totally reasonable question to say, why is it that you're going up to n in your summation and then you're pushing n off to infinity with a limit? Why not just replace this n with infinity? Hopefully, this has been addressed by what I shared earlier, these properties that we had. Remember from the previous video, these properties that we have only work for finite n. These formulas that we have only work for finite n. So in order to use this machinery that we have, we can only ever deal with finite values of n. n could be 5 trillion. It doesn't matter what it is as long as it's finite. However, how is it that we push finite numbers to infinity? We take limits. We say, hey, th this is a finite sum. 
But what happens if you take the limit as n pushes off to infinity? Well, now you can take the limit of this expression because there's no sums anymore. If you take the limit of this expression, you'll notice that the degrees of the numerator and the denominator are the same, which means you take the ratio of the leading terms or the leading coefficients, 16 over 6, which reduces to 8 over 3. So if you were to find the area of this region bounded by x, x squared on top, x-axis below, between x equals 0 and x equals 2, that area is 8 thirds, exactly. Because the limit approaches the true value of the area. 10 minutes. All right, see you guys in the next video.